The Condition of England, on which many pamphlets are now in the course of publication, and many thoughts unpublished are going on in every reflective head, is justly regarded as one of the most ominous, and withal one of the strangest, ever seen in this world. England is full of wealth, of multifarious produce, supply for human want in every kind. Yet England is dying of inanition. With unabated bounty, the land of England blooms and grows, waving with yellow harvests, thick-studded with workshops, industrial implements, with fifteen millions of workers, understood to be the strongest, the cunningest, and the willingest our earth ever had. These men are here. The work they have done, the fruit that they have realised is here, abundant, exuberant on every hand of us. And behold, some baleful fiat as of enchantment has gone forth, saying, Touch it not, ye workers, ye master workers, ye master idlers. None of you can touch it. No man of you shall be better for it. This is enchanted fruit. On the poor workers, such fiat falls first, in its rudest shape. But on the rich master workers too, it falls. Neither can the rich master idlers, nor any richest or highest man escape, but all are like to be brought low with it, and made poor enough in the money sense, or a far fataler one. Of these successful skilful workers, some two millions, it is now counted, sit in workhouses, poor law prisons, or have outdoor relief flung over the wall to them, the workhouse bastille being filled to bursting, and the strong poor law broken asunder by a stronger. They sit there, these many months now, their hope of deliverance as yet small. In workhouses, pleasantly so named, because work cannot be done in them. Twelve hundred thousand workers in England alone, their cunning right hand lamed, lying idle in their sorrowful bosom. Their hopes, outlooks, share of this fair world, shut in by narrow walls. They sit there, pent up, as in a kind of horrid enchantment, glad to be imprisoned and enchanted, that they may not perish starved. The picturesque tourist, in a sunny autumn day, through this bounteous realm of England, describes the Union workhouse on his path. Passing by the workhouse of St. Ives in Huntingdonshire, on a bright day last autumn, says the picturesque tourist, I saw sitting on wooden benches, in front of their bastille and within their ring wall and its railings, some half hundred or more of these men. Tall, robust figures, young mostly or of middle age, of honest countenance, many of them thoughtful and even intelligent-looking men. They sat there, nearby one another, but in a kind of topal, especially in a silence, which was very striking. In silence, for, alas, what word was to be said? An earth all lying round, crying, Come and till me, come and reap me, Yet we here sit enchanted. In the eyes and brows of these men hung the gloomiest expression, not of anger, but of grief and shame, and manifold in articulate distress and weariness. They returned my glance with a glance that seemed to say, Do not look at us. We sit enchanted here. We know not why. The sun shines and the earth calls, and by the governing powers and impotences of this England, 
we are forbidden to obey. It is impossible, they tell us. There was something that reminded me of Dante's hell in the look of all this, and I rode swiftly away. So many hundred thousands sit in workhouses, and other hundred thousands have not yet got even workhouses, and in thrifty Scotland itself, in Glasgow or Edinburgh City, in their dark lanes, hidden from all but the eye of God, and of rare benevolence the minister of God, there are scenes of woe and destitution, and desolation, such as, one may hope, the sun never saw before in the most barbarous regions where men dwelt. Competent witnesses, the brave and humane Dr. Allison, who speaks what he knows, whose noble healing art in his charitable hands becomes once more a truly sacred one, report these things for us. These things are not of this year, or of last year, have no reference to our present state of commercial stagnation, but only to the common state. Not in sharp fever fits, but in chronic gangrene of this kind is Scotland's suffering. A poor law, any and every poor law, it may be observed, is but a temporary measure, an anodyne, not a remedy. Rich and poor, when once the naked facts of their condition have come into collision, cannot long subsist together on a mere poor law. True enough, and yet human beings cannot be left to die. Scotland, too, till something better come, must have a poor law, if Scotland is not to be a byword among the nations. Oh, what a waste is there of noble and thrice noble national virtues, peasant stoicisms, heroisms, valiant manful habits, soul of a nation's worth, which all the metal of Potosi cannot purchase back to which the metal of Potosi, and all you can buy with it, is dross and dust. Why dwell on this aspect of the matter? It is too indisputable, not doubtful now to anyone. Descend where you will into the lower classes, in town or country, by what avenue you will, by factory inquiries, agricultural inquiries, by revenue returns, by mining labourer committees, by opening your own eyes and looking, the same sorrowful result discloses itself. You have to admit that the working body of this rich English nation has sunk or is fast sinking into a state, to which, all sides of it considered, there was literally never any parallel. At Stockport Assizes, and this too has no reference to the present state of trade, being of date prior to that, a mother and a father are arraigned and found guilty of poisoning three of their children to defraud a burial society of some thirty-one pounds eight shillings due on the death of each child. They are arraigned, found guilty, and the official authorities. It is whispered, hint that perhaps the case is not solitary, that perhaps you had better not probe farther into that department of things. This is in the autumn of 1841. The crime itself is of the previous year or season. Brutal savages, degraded Irish, mutters the idle reader of newspapers, hardly lingering on this incident. Yet it is an incident worth lingering on. The depravity, savagery and degraded Irishism being never so well admitted. In the British land, a human mother and father, professing the Christian religion, had done this thing. They, with their Irishism and necessity and savagery, had been driven to do it. Such instances 
are like the highest mountain apex emerged into view, under which lies a whole mountain region and land not yet emerged. A human mother and father had said to themselves, What shall we do to escape starvation? We are deep sunk here in our dark cellar, and help is far. Yes, in the Ugolino hunger tower stern, things happen. Best loved little Gaddo fallen dead on his father's knees. The Stockport mother and father think and hint. Our poor little starveling Tom, who cries all day for victuals, who will see only evil and not good in this world. If he were out of misery at once, he well dead, and the rest of us perhaps kept alive? It is thought and hinted. At last it is done. And now Tom being killed, and all spent and eaten, is it poor little starveling Jack that must go? Or poor little starveling Will? What an inquiry of ways and means! In starved, sieged cities, in the uttermost doomed ruin of old Jerusalem, fallen under the wrath of God, it was prophesied and said, The hands of the pitiful woman have sodden their own children. The stern Hebrew imagination could conceive no blacker gulf of wretchedness. That was the ultimatum of degraded God-punished man. And we here, in modern England, exuberant with supply of all kinds, besieged by nothing if it not be by invisible enchantments, are we reaching that? How come these things? Wherefore are they? Wherefore should they be? Nor are they of the St. Ives at workhouses, of the Glasgow lanes and Stockport cellars, the only unblessed amongst us. This successful industry of England, with its plethoric wealth, has as yet made nobody rich. It is an enchanted wealth, and belongs yet to nobody. We might ask, which of us has it enriched? We can spend thousands where we once spent hundreds, but can purchase nothing good with them. In poor and rich, instead of noble thrift and plenty, there is idle luxury alternating with mean scarcity and inability. We have sumptuous garnitures for our life, but have forgotten to live in the middle of them. It is an enchanted wealth. No man of us can yet touch it. The class of men who feel that they are truly better off by means of it, let them give us their name. Many men eat finer cookery, drink dearer liquors. With what advantage they can report, and their doctors can. But in the heart of them, if we go out of the dyspeptic stomach, what increase of blessedness is there? Are they better, beautifuller, stronger, braver? Are they even what they call happier? Do they look with satisfaction on more things and human faces in this God's earth? Do more things and human faces look with satisfaction on them? Not so. Human faces gloom discordantly, disloyally on one another. Things if it be not mere cotton and iron things, are growing disobedient to man. The master worker is enchanted, for the present, like his workhouse workman, clamours, in vain hitherto, for a very simple sort of liberty. The liberty to buy where he finds it cheapest, to sell where he finds it dearest. With guineas jingling in every pocket, he was no whit richer, but now, the very guineas threatening to vanish, he feels that he is poor indeed. Poor master worker! And the master unworker, is not he in a still fataler situation? Pausing amid his game preserves with awful eye, 
as he well may, coercing fifty-pound tenants, coercing, bribing, cajoling, doing what he likes with his own, his mouth full of loud futilities and arguments to prove the excellence of his corn law, and in his heart the blackest misgiving, a desperate half-consciousness that his excellent corn law is indefensible, that his loud arguments for it are of a kind to strike men too literally dumb. To whom, then, is this wealth of England wealth? Who is it that it blesses, makes happier, wiser, beautifuler, in any way better? Who has got hold of it to make it fetch and carry for him, like a true servant, not like a false mock servant, to do him any real service whatsoever? As yet, no one. We have more riches than any nation ever had before. We have less good of them than any nation had before. Our successful industry is hitherto unsuccessful. A strange success, if we stop here. In the midst of plethoric plenty, the people perish. With gold walls and full barns, no man feels himself safe or satisfied. Workers, master workers, unworkers, all men come to a pause, stand fixed, and cannot farther. Fatal paralysis spreading inwards, from the extremities, in St. Ives workhouses, in stockport cellars, through all limbs, as if towards the heart itself. Have we actually got enchanted, then? Accursed by some god? Midas longed for gold and insulted the Olympians. He got gold, so that whatsoever he touched became gold, and he, with his long ears, was little the better for it. Midas had misjudged the celestial music tones. Midas had insulted Apollo and the gods. The gods gave him his wish, and a pair of long ears, which also were a good appendage to it. What a truth in these old fables.